we're not in this earth indefinitely, we will get extinct. That's the ultimate objective of our species. So a <laughs> based on that, what is it that um, a, our research aim at was trying to remove the obstacles in order to improve the adoption rate of this high value traditional crops. So uh, there, there were two options from my standpoint, very a, uh, a economic, a, uh, but you will see how I infused economics with a heterodox approach. Uh, the possibility is that we need to increase the rent of the crop Therefore, that will be revealed in the opportunity cost. How is it that we can make that happen? Basically, a, a, we have to change the way that the crops are being produced. Or the other possibility is that there is an, an, an actual increase in the area of orphan crops, but not in its rent, not in the amount of money that you can derive out of it, and then the changes can be attributed to formal and informal institutions. When I talk about institutions, I'm not talking about organizations. I talk about institutions as rules, norms, and traditions, uh, including laws. Um, so. A, some of the parameters that might affect the opportunity cost, and that's what I want to focus on, could be land prices, seed prices, a, the art, a, how do you grow with pesticides, the price of the pesticides, the amount of irrigation that you use, the technology of irrigation, the labor costs associated with the technology and access to markets. Those will largely affect your opportunity costs. A, um, so I will focus on technology. And the work on technology, I would like you to take a look at this. It. It's, it's, it's a bit too big, that graph. But if you, if you look at it, uh, you will see that we have different combination of crops that uh, farmers, local farmers, uh, uh, adopt in a semi-arid Kenya. You will see that a, a, you will see that a LM4 and LM5 are two types of uh, environments. LM5 is more arid than LM4. Uh, and you will see that the percent of time, labor time devoted to birds caring increases dramatically when you include sorghum and millet in your production. So, I started thinking about then what is it, how is it that we can, if labor time as a associate or devoted to birds caring is one major obstacle as we can see here that people devote up to a 70% of their time scaring birds, that might be an obstacle. That might be one of the major obstacles that we have to overcome if we want to improve the adoption rate of these uh, traditional crops. Uh, by doing, a, then we have to take a look at what is it that theory tells us about that. So we have, a, according to mainstream economic theory, we have a, um, four, option, a, four options. Basically, they talk about three options. The fourth option is a, immediately discarded. So the first option is equilibrium. You don't do anything. A, uh, you just leave it as it is. There are no changes. We have to deal with a, a crop rates a, by birds as they are. The other possibility is that uh, we engage in individual intervention, so basically, oh God, uh, we, I have one minute, so uh, <laughs> uh, I think this is my uh, la last slide. So uh, what we have in, in what, what we call the ripple effect is when farmers adopt individual uh, technologies, these are technologies to scaring birds. So let's say that um, we all live in the same community, and I have the means to scare bear birds, I'm able to buy nets. So I cover all of my field with nets. Where the f birds go to? They will go to your field, guys. So basically, at the community level, we will not see an improvement in 
our yield. We will not see an improvement in a, the rent that we can derive out of a, a growing a traditional crops. So what would be the solution? Well, great Coase will tell us, uh, Coase, Ronald Coase, from his uh, 1960s theory, he, he would say, from his theorem, he would say, well, basically, we just need to negotiate individually. One, I, so basically, since I'm able to put nets in my fields, I will compensate you guys for the losses that are incurred by the birds who are flying from my field to your field. So basically, what we need to do is to track each bird and see how many seeds each bird is consuming in each of your fields. Very cheap, no? Very easy to do. How are we going to do that? That's an impossibility. That is an economic impossibility of applying their mainstream a, a recommendations. Third option, extirpation. We bring flamethrowers and we burn bird nests. That's it. Done. We deal with the issue of birds. We eliminated, we extirpated bird populations. But you know what's going to happen afterwards. No, we will have more pests. We will have more insects consuming our crops. Therefore, that is not an actual solution to our conflict. So what the last option is collective action, which is understanding that the birds are part of our agroecosystem. They have the right to consume the food as we have the right to consume food. Therefore, we have to embrace a sovereignty approach where we all have the right to food, humans and non-humans. And by doing that, by, by understanding that we all have to coexist in this territory, we as humans can organize to try to collectively scare birds not extirpate, not eliminate them from our territory, but reduce their impact evenly throughout our communities. By doing that, we're actually going against what mainstream economic science is saying, and basically we are challenging Harding, who's saying, well, the solution to the destruction a, a, to commons management is let's divide and rule. Here we're saying, let's not divide and rule. Let's bring all of us together and try to find a collective solution for this issue. Uh, well, this is, uh, this is a game. If you're interested in games, we, we can play this game. And you will see that in an evolutionary time scale, collective action is what we call an evolutionary stable solution. So. A, uh, let's embrace a notion of food sovereignty, moving from an individualistic understanding of a, uh, this food security and embracing that we are a social animal. And as such, let's behave socially. Thank you. Not bad. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> Questions, comments uh, on food security, livelihoods, confronting neoliberal growth. Uh, let's just take us, uh, maybe uh, we'll take someone who hasn't yet spoken, and but we'll get around to other hands. Leah. Is that working? Yeah, thanks. Um, so just uh, thank you very much for the presentations. Uh, just some uh, broader comments about the, um, this uh, area, or thematic area. 
So I was also looking at the, uh, the description that you have from the last time, and then one thing that really stuck out to me was that it says here, the beneficiaries of the food sovereignty movement are marginalized people, small-scale peasants, landless farmers, rural workers, hunters, fishers, women, youth, and indigenous peoples. And I guess one question is, are they the beneficiaries or are they the actors of these movements? And I think uh, specifically when we're talking about indigenous people, it's very interesting to look at their role and the role, the political role they've been taking in these food sovereignty movements. So, um, I mean, I had been, I work with some other groups that are really working much more from an agrarian political economy approach. And uh, they have, for example, been very much involved in the Committee for Food Security and the civil society mechanism there, working on the voluntary guidelines for tenure. Um, so what, I mean, I think the types of questions we can begin to ask is also, what is the framing or what is the place of indigenous people's struggle within these processes? And uh, understand a little bit more what the synergies and also the tensions are between indigenous movements and agrarian movements. Uh, that would be one uh, one area. I think it could be expanded further. As some other questions, I think that are not mentioned here is, of course, uh, the role of, and this is something that's come up a lot in the the past days, is uh, climate change and food sovereignty. And this has come up, for example, uh, discussions about uh, RED, for example, how uh, RED and other mechanisms could impact the food sovereignty of indigenous communities, or even the carbon farming that was mentioned. What is, how does that influence food sovereignty in the light of uh, climate change? And also, as we were talking about uh, adaptation, plans in the long term. So how are we, you know, changing the types of innovations and the knowledge that is needed to confront climate change and how that's impacting uh, food systems. Um, okay, well I have, um, I mean I think the other major issue that could be really brought more into, into, this, uh, into this thematic area uh, you, I mean, it's of course it's mentioned uh, this coping with neoliberal growth, but uh, I think we can look a little bit deeper into what are uh, the incursions of these globalized agro food system into indigenous territories, and this, uh, you know, we're looking at it in terms of extractive industries, and we can say that uh, the agro globalized agro food system is also extractive. But if we want to look at it within uh, specifically within this thematic area, uh, we can say, you know these land grabbing processes and also the resistances uh, to them and the potential alliances, as I mentioned before, between uh, you know, those promoting conservation, between pastoralist groups, between farmer and agrarian groups, and between indigenous groups. So I won't go into detail, but just throwing uh, some of these areas on the table for... Thank you. Yeah, uh, let's... Uh, let's uh put the comments forth in point form and, and uh, we'll get around to uh, a few more people. I, I think Fanny and Hector, I saw their hands up and there, there's another hand uh, somewhere that I, did, did anyone else? Okay, Fanny. Ah, muchas gracias. Uh, Thank you very much. I want to talk to you about a reality that we all face. It is hunger. The First Nations, out, uh, the Native peoples, we have, we're facing hunger in the north of the country. Uh, and, and we are having problems with lack of food. La Guajira on Google, there are people who are suffering from hunger in this region. It's worse than in Rwanda. 
Rwanda, uh, better uh, the same or worse than uh, Rwanda. Children are starving, and this is what is happening for the forest peoples as well. Before it was the forest. I come from the forest, and so forests were very rich at the time in terms of resources, fish, uh, birds, uh, um, animals to hunt. We had food sovereignty. I don't know. It's because of if it's because of the effects of climate change, but there are uh, species that are disappearing. Phenomena, phenomena didn't exist before. There are floods sometimes, and uh, all the parcels uh, for agriculture are devastated, are flooded. So I'll give you an example of what happened in Colombia. I saw that in the territory there were floods. The uh, land for agriculture was devastated, inundated, so we had no food for the people. And we asked the government to help us, help us, uh, sirs, please help us to realize some projects for production of food for agriculture. We wanted to find ways to be able to quickly uh, sow foods to have um, some, uh, some food, some plants so we can have food. And the bureaucracy of the state does not allow that. They did not help us. I made a simple request. This uh, it became a bureaucratic process, and we hired a, an institution that was uh, um, help there to help us to research it and develop a project uh, we can do it on territory. And so, when this project, when a project doesn't really have an approach that considers our reality, it becomes a colossal defeat. So I want to uh, uh, follow up on the work that I do to talk about when we make a request and that there's an institution that uh, received our demand. They sent 300 chickens. It cost a fortune sending 300 uh, chickens. It come, they come from Brazil. There was uh, food in the containers, but there wasn't any food in the community to feed the chickens. We had food, but we didn't have anything to feed them with. So there's a woman who said, well, the chicken looked at me. I had nothing to give it to feed. It, it, the chicken wanted to eat me, so I had to eat it. So that was the end of the chickens. So these are projects for um, food safety, but they don't consider our reality that is different. We don't consider the differences. Uh, food sovereignty for uh, First Nations communities or Native communities is different. It's not a political question only. It's not a question of development. It's a question of survival, of life and death. The communities are dying in La Guajira. I would uh, go see in Google, look at La Guajira and Niños, children. And the children are dying of hunger in La Guajira. And I brought with me here some um, um, handicrafts, handcrafts, and uh, 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 feeds children. So if you uh, buy something from me, it feeds a child for a month. And I don't profit from this. We use this to uh, help children to eat. If you buy one of these objects, you uh, um, feed a child for a month. Sí, eh. Hunger makes people run after food and weakens people and they weaken the body but also spiritually. You don't eat, your body is weak, your spirit is weak. The solution is not easily attainable. I am part of a family that has suffered from hunger in my youth and lack of resources. We knew what hunger was in my family. I know what being hungry is about. And when I think about these issues, sovereignty, food sovereignty, and all these debates that we're having, 
in my reserve, in my res guardo, the concept of food security has been mentioned. And it's an idea of as to having food available in the market. And so our communities don't have money to buy this food stuff. And so this is a um, horrendous thing. There can be food in the market, but if you have no money to buy it, how are you, what are you going to do? So that is the case of my family and a lot of families in the country. So why do you want to go to the market in my community, the, the village, and where there's a food store? It takes 40 minutes to go there. There's a transport that is used, but you have no money to pay for transportation, and you have no money to pay for food. It's not a question of availability of food. We have to be able to produce land to produce these things. That's the difference of the concept that we have. Uh, for us, it's different in my reserve, in my resguardo, or, or in the country in general. What happens is the institutions of the state have uh, had a policy of monoculture. It was the case uh, for my region, the case of coffee. That's one of the realities to solve the problem, to have more revenue. So what they did was they destroyed the communities. They thought that all these communities needed was to work and uh, access to the markets and so there's a distinction here between the policies of the state and certain governance uh, structures that think that First Nations communities, Native communities, poor communities, communities that don't have access to land and property, all they would need are industries, agro-business uh, to hire people who don't have access to land. These are not winning conditions. There's a huge difference because in our communities we talk about sovereignty of food, uh, but we have worked um, a lot on our reserve on this idea of organizing people, organizing ourselves to have uh, food at home. And there's this logic of the markets and the state. It's different. You have uh, six uh, boxes of tomatoes uh, you want to produce uh, and share them with members of your family, but you're not going to produce to sell at the market. So the government doesn't understand this uh, logic, this other way of thinking. They want to create uh, rich wealth for the market, but it's a different idea. So things are complicated because of that. So how do we solve the problem? There's the, the subsistence economy and there's food sovereignty. But I think a lot of people have talked about that. I'm a governor and these are discussions that we had in my reserve. I really insisted that people will be organized around food sovereignty so that people can be organized so we have a subsistence source of food. But there's another debate here. We need need money as well to buy food and things that we cannot produce. So you're going to need certain products from the market. You will need money. So I don't know if that's the right word, but a word that has been used the other day is this idea of hybridity, or of a hybrid uh, that you will produce for yourself. You must put food on the table, but you must also buy things from the market. Uh, so it's like the birds. You cannot kill the birds. So there's a logic in that uh, community. So we have to sow, not just for ourselves, but for the animals as well. So there's uh, three um, plants that we plant, uh, corn and um, one for me, one for the animals, and the third one is for the spirits. We have to plant once for ourselves, one for the animals, one for the uh, spirits. And so uh, that is uh, very important. So what Fanny has said here is uh, really uh, difficult, and there's communities where children die of hunger. La Guarira is a really horrible case. It's horrible. There's uh, Iseralda, Miracha, and other 
local communities. And uh, for me, in my community, people don't die of hunger, but they suffer uh, regardless of hunger in my community, in my resguardo, in my reserve. Thank you very much. Uh, time to switch uh, to the next theme. <laughs> Uh, and unless there was anything, you, I think you indicated that uh, you were fine not to have a, okay, okay, good. Okay, so um, we move on to the final uh, access for the morning. <coughs> and uh, this is uh, Martin Hébert, uh, Davikin Studnicki, um, will be addressing the theme of the, uh, the politics of resource extraction. Okay, uh, so access four. Yeah. yeah, here we go. Uh, so again, thanks to the Wendat for the welcome uh, here. And uh, thanks for Colin for daring to do this. And Margaret and Melanie for uh, pulling it off. And to all of you for being here. Um, I've been a bit of an outsider uh, and learning a lot over the past uh, years and just wanted to thank you again. Um, we're going to go over this. I, we're going to sort of tag team, and I think uh, we're going to do it bilingually. Uh, we are going to do it bilingually, uh, French and English. I'll just do um, a quick review of you know what was said, uh, an assessment of what has been done, and then Martin uh, will sort of put out some ideas about you know where, where things could go on, on this theme. Okay. So uh, first thing um, is that I wanted to note that. Uh, this axis, axis four, it was uh, emergent within the uh, Instead and Cicada uh, projects, whose original guiding concerns had been indigenous forms of stewardship and development, but it quickly became clear that the extractivist question was going to loom quite large over the proceedings, mainly because confronting extractivist incursions have demanded such a huge amount of energy, uh, political and social efforts on the part of indigenous communities. So those incursions present, um, as Mario Blasser said uh, uh, about three or four meetings ago, um, the urgencies that have gotten in the way of what is important, okay? That is uh, a forwarding those collective life projects that are consonant with indigenous values and ways of being uh, in the world. So, Large-scale extractive projects, whether we're talking about mines or oil and gas, hydro, timber extraction, are incursions. Est-ce qu'on pourrait juste avancer la slide? Okay, c'est ça. Non, c'est ça. Non, c'est ça. Okay. Um, <clears throat> so large-scale extractive projects are incursions because they're not invited or initiated by indigenous nations because the material and economic benefits of those activities are destined for others, and because the consequences, whether we're talking uh, about social, cultural, or environmental consequences, are disproportionately borne by indigenous peoples and territories. So contemporary extractivism becomes then a key part of how colonial relations have been rep reproduced and actualized uh, in our present. But what happens in the course of those incursions is quite complex and it varies a great deal from context to context, and it involves, evolves uh, over time. And so understanding those dynamics and the range of dynamics is important for a number of reasons, and I think that that's what, was, what we tried to capture uh, in our description that's up on the website and here is kind of resumed in a few kind of these five points. Um, but just some comments. You know, what we're trying to do here in terms of the aims is to make visible the interior realities of extraction. So and we've heard you know, over the years uh, you know, a number of uh, examples of this or different dimensions of this. So it can include you know, the plays of power that are involved in obtaining regulatory approval through EIAs uh, or the conduct of consultation exercises that are sponsored and structured by states and corporations. 
and includes the different forms of corporate governmentality that become deployed in communities and territories that surround uh, or, or come to unwillingly host or willingly host uh, extraction projects. Uh, it includes the rise in intra-community divisions, conflicts, outright violence. So we've seen a lot of that. Um, collaborative research with indigenous communities then, and this is it, the aim, is, is an effort to peel away some of the corporate messaging on what is happening uh, when uh, a mining or an oil project enters into an indigenous uh, territory. And bringing together different communities uh, around the table or within the structure of cicada uh, who are dealing with extractives helps not just understanding but actual or potentially actual political work of linking up different forms and possibilities of resistance. It supports mutual learning around the challenges and ways of maintaining rights and autonomy in the face of extraction. So that's a terrible slide, uh, but it's a really quick, uh, you know, we're sort of tabulating, you know, what are all the different projects and teams and places that are dealing with extractives. And uh, so this is by no means a comprehensive list, uh, but we've got here, you know, 12 plus teams and projects. You know, when we talk about extractives, uh, we're talking about, you know, communities and, and nations dealing with uh, mining, with oil and gas, hydro and forestry, which on the one hand looks like sectoral uh, diversity and range, uh, but um, this is maybe a personal view of this, but there's some kind of hard DNA that links all those forms of, just, uh, of extractives and in, informs institutional um, arrangements, the kind of the genealogies of, of, those, of those forms of uh, so-called resource uh, development. Um, so you have a range there across sectors. There's quite a broad, and that's really important, a broad geographic uh, scope. Um, as I said, this is not a comprehensive list. Uh, there are some newcomers just at the meeting, this meeting, um, that are here today that bring a great deal of experience uh, and knowledge of the indigenous extractives uh, interface. And so yesterday, for instance, we heard from Hector Jaime uh, Vinasco, from Vivian uh, Weitzer, uh, from Fa uh, Fanny Cuiru uh, Castro. Uh, tomorrow we're gonna be hearing more from Lea Temper and her work on the Ejolt Atlas of Social Ecological Conflicts. And of course there are many others, or maybe others, uh, whose experience in research connects to this issue, but uh, we haven't seen it yet, or it, like it, it's there kind of in the background in the teamwork. Uh, and so it's gonna be uh, important, wonderful uh, to hear more from them uh, and getting more actual information kind of funneling in uh, to our access is gonna be helpful for the reformulation and, and uh, work of, of the application or the formulation work of the application. Okay, review of what uh, we've accomplished, what has been done. Um, <clears throat> so, uh, Cicada brings together a very productive mix of breadth, uh, depth, and variety on the extractives questions, all right? There have been other multi-sided, uh, multi-teamed research projects on extractives. Uh, for those working in the Latin American context, you'll know uh, of the work of Anthony Bebbington and his team uh, who worked in Peru, Ecuador, Colombia, and that's an important referent. Uh, but the Cicada assemblage, uh, I think, is distinct, and I think this needs to be foregrounded and recognized um, in the way that it's entwining or it entwines First Nations and research agendas uh, together. It's also distinct in its geographic scope, so it's not only, a co I mean, it's really, much broader than anything I, I, I know of or, or is out there. Um, and it's actually, uh, in, in, in important ways, distinct in the range of approaches and the methodologies. The critical work uh, will be to move from that potential, the potential represented here, into tangible outcomes for First Nations and for researchers. And so when I thought about, when I, as I was thinking about you know, what has been done over the last two years, I think what has been done is the important but intangible uh, work of laying the foundations of collaboration, of bringing all those pieces uh, together. This is basic 
and vital work of creating and deepening links between researchers and communities, between communities and between researchers. So all those kind of ways of connecting up. Um, as researchers, we've been able to learn uh, about what we're all up to. And so this is pretty standard procedure in these settings, granted, but the diversity here has made for connections and learning that don't necessarily happen in more disciplinarily bound uh, meetings. I don't think I would have ever heard of all these different aspects if I hadn't been showing up uh, in, these, in, the, in, in this in Cicada. Um, and this, what this has led to, and I think that's an accomplishment, is a much more fulsome understanding of the different issues at play uh, when extractivism incurs into indigenous territories. So here are some examples. Uh, there's the, the clash of ontologies, of epistemologies. You don't necessarily hear that in the, the geographer's kind of rendering of, of those uh, dynamics. The clash of valuation, um, of expertise. Tenure, titling, sovereignty uh, is at play, and that's been foregrounded in our discussions. And we've also come to realize some, uh, some fairly disconcerting links between conservation uh, and mining or extractivism, uh, as well as other forms of green uh, capitalism. Um, representatives of First Nations uh, have also, in these meetings, come to meet one another quickly, maybe too quickly, uh, during the meetings, but also in a more engaged and productive way during visits to one another's uh, home territories. It's kind of a secondary activity around these uh, meetings. So we've had Maya Mam uh, delegations uh, who went up to visit the other Gold Core uh, project that they had been hearing so much about and ask for, uh, for themselves what the Cree of Wiminji uh, thought. Jorge Nahuel uh, shared his considerable ex expertise and experience with ICAs, uh, with Anobe in Panama, who are also involved in uh, developing community-based forms of, of stewardship and conservation. The Nobe and the Bugle delegations, when they've come to these meetings, have also taken the opportunity to visit other partner, uh, uh, partner uh, nations, so the Algonquins of Barrier Lake and the Cree uh, in Udre uh, Bugamu. In uh, discussion, I think it'd be good to have some more reflection from the partners, uh, Indigenous uh, nation partners, on those experiences, and because I kind of see it from a bit from the outside, but just to see how that can be um, more fruitful, where it's actually productive uh, there. Um, extractive, looking at extractives has benefited from the methodologies or methodological axes, uh, so participatory uh, video making and cartography. These have already been uh, enacted or like, put to work. Um, last spring, Stephen Schnorr did a really bang up, uh, rapid deployment tour of Argentina, Panama and Guatemala, uh, you know, and, that, that, and hopefully that's just the beginning and, and more of that can actually uh, happen. And finally, I want to underscore um, the importance of better understanding the terms and the challenges of collaboration as an outcome in and of itself that's been achieved over the last uh, couple of years. Uh, Charles Menzies has made uh, regular interventions uh, on this and they've been very uh, useful. And I'm pretty sure that none of the people listed uh, earlier in this, uh, on the team um, reduce the extractive situation to simply a matter of academic uh, interest. We're motivated to work in our domain as researchers in support of our indigenous partners. But certainly uh, history shows that meaning well is no guarantee of working well uh, together. So figuring out how to articulate indigenous and research agendas on the base of equity and respect for difference comes with a lot of weight and complexity. And that's really what Sir Charles's and others' interventions have really kind of shown here. Um, so collaborative research methodologies is not defined as an axis or as even as a theme, but it strikes me as uh, foundational uh, to the entire uh, Cicada enterprise. So I'd certainly vote for more discussion and reflection on the challenges of uh, working together. Okay. So I'll pass it to Martin in terms of uh, looking forwards. Thank you, Devin.
Bon, euh, je vois qu'il est... Euh... Oh, I see that it is now 11.59, so I'm going to try to be brief, but uh, just to follow up on what Devigan just talked about, I would like to think a little bit about the directions that uh, this axis can uh, take on extractivism and violence and uh, in the community. So essentially what we tried to do in uh, getting together to talk about this axis and to uh, uh, and to uh, have an overview of this. What have we done that is directly related to its cicada? Meaning that, uh, yes, we could see um, that everybody has projects, research projects uh, um, on their own, but um, one of our preoccupations that I think that can certainly be used to uh, feed uh, the uh, production of this uh, request for funding and to ask the question as our researchers Catherine Norais has said a reflection on what makes one of our projects a cicada project. Well, what cicada can do to add a complement, I wouldn't say an added value here, but to add a plus to our projects. So basically, these are all uh, reflections we had. We're not talking about uh, necessarily talking about financial resources, but how the expertise uh, present at this table uh, related to different communities, how could this help us develop this axis? As David Ken said, for two years, we've gone through a certain stage where we're getting to know each other. But for this to become a more productive relationship, we'll have to see what resources can be mobilized and how and why, which leads us to other avenues that we've seen that could be interesting to develop within the Cicada project. The second uh, point I wanted to bring up was to see how Cicada could be an interesting site to accentuate ties with community partners, which means it's become a current practice in research in collaboration with Native Aboriginal peoples to develop solid partnerships with the communities, except that here we have a concept which is quite interesting, and as you see, will be uh, quite essential when we talk about extractivism and the violence associated with it. So we have a context when we can uh, build a very broad uh, network of partners, communities that can talk uh, to each other through uh, across continents and uh, varying contexts and communities that can show solidarity amongst uh, themselves. So we can put an emphasis on community partners amongst themselves must uh, enter the extractivism uh, component, but in others as well. One of the essential uh, goals of Sikare and our axis is are these uh, inter-community -com ties implies transfers of knowledge and experience and a which have a central role for these communities. Other reasons that these partnerships are important. And this is really something that emerged over the last two years of the discussion. It's also that these uh, relations with the communities allow us to collectively uh, listen to not only knowledge and know-how uh, of the communities, but also to the requests uh, for research. And one of these requests, which seems to be particularly interesting, was to expand the uh, scope or uh, the framework of different research. And here's a, I can give you a concrete example of the research that I conducted with the Huron Wendat Nation, where we are today. It's just to say that this nation has a territorial office in charge of consultations, in charge of answering uh, different projects that are deposited. And this bureau, or this office, has uh, houses about 15 
uh, professionals in the rush period and the busy period. There is 18 professionals, uh, of whom uh, most are uh, are members of the nation. So we have researchers in the, in the nation, and where they have some people who all have capacity to study themselves, to document their own oral traditions and to map their own uh, land use, to go into the archives, uh, etc. So these nations, who over the last decades, they have truly taken control, uh, they've reappropriated the production of uh, knowledge that concerns them. This is uh, great, we all agree with this, but these resources are always limited. And before a situation of limited resources, the nation will prioritize research on itself. It doesn't necessarily have the resources to look uh, it, uh, into uh, its uh, interlocutors. And the comment was made in many presentations, but in a context of extraction uh, economy, we're always in a sort of relationship or a tension, a confrontation in a context where a people or a community is uh, articulated within a system and efficient access depends on the comprehension we have of this system. So the component or reflection on the extraction uh, economy, economic sector will require us to complete this uh, local community knowledge with the development of tools that will allow them to uh, look at this system uh, more broadly. On my part, with the relations with the Huron Wendat Nation, this is the kind of requests that are made. For example, a concrete example, the nation has deposited many times now. For a few years, the, the nation keeps the, uh, submitting a protected area project. This protected area is based on local knowledge, inquiries made by the nation, and they said, well, basically, let's deposit this project. We don't, but we never know what's happening. No one answers us. No one seems to know what uh, this is about. So we'd like to know what circulation will, this project will have in the ministry. So basically, the research that was developed is institutional ethnography of certain ministries or offices of the Quebec government to try to see where uh, or how this project was received. And I can tell you that we had all kinds of results. People told us uh, bluntly, they said, when we have a native project uh, on our uh, desk, it goes right to the, w the, the garbage. And other people who referred us to their lawyers to say, well, basically, it's a file of uh, concerning the province's uh, integral territory. So, so to study others in this relationship, we talked about a neoliberal ontology. Well, it's an uh, or a neoliberal ideology becomes a central element. So, institutional ethnograph uh, ethnographies will be developed, and other researchers in the axis talk about mapping, mapping. Uh, cash flow, uh, capital flow, on mapping flow of certain um, master ideas or dominant ideas that are conveyed in the extraction industries, like the idea of social acceptability, a concept which initially emerged in a rather critical context to say that your uh, project should have a certain level of social acceptability, which through all kinds of institutional filters, which uh, drifted towards a, a definition of uh, public relations. So this is uh, acceptability is something we produce. We don't ask them what is acceptable for them, is that we present our project by modulating it and uh, coding it in different ways until people say yes or until people stop saying no. 
in some cases. So when there's no one, the people, the shouting has died down, well, we consider it accepted. So here we have a, a huge world to document in which life projects that we're talking about and the state and all of the actors and the points of view we've been talking about over, since yesterday are uh, intimately associated and we have important work to do here and the phase that was more active or visible in the short term of this kind of research is our item four where we said basically if we're for the development of uh, developing the extraction sector we should work as researchers and also as community collectives, uh, community research collectives, to set up uh, replies that uh, have a, di a discourse or a speech that is readable and that replies to this ideological production uh, of the industry and governments regarding, for example, impacts or uh, spin-offs of extraction uh, projects in the communities. And I think that uh, belonging to a center like Cicada and uh, the collective strength that is created by the group we have here becomes very important because, as you know, some of you who worked on issues, talked about mining companies or mining, or oil it puts uh, researchers in very vulnerable situations. And the only protection that researchers can have regarding this machine that is created to uh, neutralize and uh, stifle criticism is these networks are studies that multiply and it give strength to this scientific uh, production of testimonials coming from the communities and uh, the pooling of experiences. I work more in the forest sector, but when we have multinational forest companies that operate in Canada and also in Latin America, it would be a bad idea to make a parallel between their behavior in both contexts. And you say, look what's happening in your community. Other communities are going through similar situations. So I'll stop here. I think David can uh, set the, the table, and I'll, sh I'll talk to you about the directions you can go. But you know what you see right away. We're not talking about fundamental research. It's happening in our uh, subsidized projects between each of us, but it could also take place more particularly in Cicada. Our, uh, is it taking a position, the production of tools, and the, and the production of these uh, networks that allow us to articulate a counter message. Um, I'm new to Cicada, and um, one of the questions that's just come up for me during this whole day of discussions is whether or not there is a statement of ethics and principles for the research that we're doing here with um, First Nations and, and Indigenous and Inuit Métis peoples, um, because it seems to me that there needs, uh, and maybe there is, uh, so it's just a question I have for, of clarification, is there a statement of principles for the, the vision that there is, or the type of research, or the type of um, relationships that um, are emerging from this center. In other words, are there ethical um, guidelines for the work? Um, is, has there been a, 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 a um, you know, that it should be community driven, that there should be objectives, um, you know, done in uh, collaboration with the communities? I just, so I'm just putting that out there because it's something that Davikin sort of brought up with a collaborative approach in some of the extractive projects. And certainly when you're looking at extractives, if, you, if it isn't community driven, you're probably not going to be able to do very deep work in communities. So I'm just putting that, uh, so it's a question that I have. Is there a statement of principles for how, um, you know, we are hoping to operate as a center with indigenous peoples um, and, and how that works? And then I have a couple of other co comments about the, uh, the actual theme. 
So the, um, I'll just go right in uh, then. So I've, you know, my background is in both in protected areas and in uh, working with extractives, but mostly my background is working with people and upholding self-determination. And so here's where, um, in doing the work that I've done over the last, now I'm realizing 16 years in extractives working with people, um, there's a huge diversity of approaches and acceptance to the industry or non-acceptance to the industry, depending on where you are and your political context and where you hope to go. And so um, I'm just a little bit cautious of being completely anti-mining. Um, and to, to, to maybe we frame things in terms of self-determination and what, you know, because um, it sounds to me like this theme is anti-extractivism, basically, right? I mean, that's the sense that I'm getting hearing people that, you know, this neoliberal model, this, but sometimes people actually want it. And what do you do then? And so are we making a political statement that we're going to be acting, you know, so I'm just putting that out there as a, as a question. Um, and also, um, uh, there's a question of scales, too, um, of the industry um, and, um, and of who gets involved with industry. So I work now with communities who are miners themselves and who do an ancestral mining. It's a whole different, different concept. It's a different cosmology. It comes from a different place. Um, and um, so I find myself actively supporting and working with miners themselves. So, um, you know, I'm just putting that out there so that we cross boundaries in terms of how we label things and, and, and really bring out some of the complexities that are behind, um, behind the themes. And, and finally, um, just uh, the various actors. We always talk about state and we talk about communities. Well, where I work and in a bunch of different um, countries, um, Max, from Mexico, Peru, Ecuador, there's illegal arms groups that are really involved with this industry and, um, and communities that are very affected by these, these groups and this whole other side of the economy that we need to think about also when we're looking at extraction and this theme, not just the state and communities, but this whole other shady economy that's happening with the narco world and um, you know, illegal um, or outlawed groups. So I'm just putting that out there um, to try and just add complexity to what we're thinking about here. Uh, I think Karin was the name. No, actually, Leia, uh, Leia's hand was up before Karin's. So uh, we got Leia, Karin, uh, Jorge, Clint, and uh, how much? How many minutes left? Uh, three minutes. <laughs> uh, maybe we can stretch it to eight. Uh, we're going to have to get downstairs pretty soon. Um, okay, I'll, I'll be brief. Um, just uh, to follow up to some of the points you made um, about this, uh, I don't know, I'm also new to Cicada, so I don't know about uh, this ethical guidelines you were talking about, but the project I will be presenting tomorrow, we are working on this and we are hoping to elaborate this process together. So th that could be one also a potential line of collaboration. And then uh, about the, um, I mean, I think this is also very much about the definition. What you're asking is also about what the definition of extractivism is and how the term is used. Um, in Brazil, for example, you know, Chico Mendes and the rubber tappers were fighting for the extractivist reserves that they could use and extract the resources. So the term extractivism, of course, has it's, it's used in many different ways. And what, um, I mean, what for me has been very interesting was this experience that you mentioned of the uh, of the community mining and sh you know bringing uh, the new project I'll present tomorrow is also uh, really focused on this element of what are the you know out of the responses to industrial extractivism or large scale extractivism what are the you know, responses that come up and how our communities uh, putting forward their own projects. So I think that CICADA has, you know, these sorts of stories that we're seeing show that there's also important stories to share in that regard. So I think that within this theme, uh, expanding a little bit more on how we're defining extractivism, the different forms of extractivism, and that can perhaps answer some of the questions that you're bringing forward. Thanks, Karin. Yes, so, uh, <coughs> uh, oui, ça, ça marche. Okay. Uh, so, uh, actually, just I'm losing my voice. 
Um, Cicada is not anti-mining, uh, well, because I've, I've been in Cicada uh, for a while and, and uh, uh, working with the Cree Nation of Women Jews signing a collaboration agreement, there's definitely, they're definitely not anti-mining as uh, the leaders and probably Sami would uh, agree with me on that. But uh, to rebound on what David Ken said that we, and, and to rebound also on, on there's no, uh, well, you can clarify for me, but from what I remember, we didn't declare a ethics principle of how, and guidelines of how we should uh, do work with, so it's kind of an implicit uh, way of engaging indigenous communities that we share. But it's true that uh, I would agree that we need, uh, I feel I need your help to think more about collaboration methodologies because there was a lot of things I was taking for granted when I decided to compare the experience of the Cree Nation of Women G with the same mining company and the, the uh, Maya Mams of Guatemala. And, I'm, I'm, uh, and then also keep an eye on, on the institution and trying to engage them and then also engage the, the government, uh, you know, and meeting with CSR people and everything. And, and I'm, I'm pull, I feel sometimes that uh, when you try to bring that all together, it, it creates huge challenges. And I'm not going to go in detail now because I know I can talk tomorrow, but just I will definitely say that uh, I feel Cicada could be more supportive in, in, uh, in uh, yeah, in creating a space where we can uh, de deconstruct those methodologies and talk about them and talk about our challenge with our indigenous partners and what does solidarity mean uh, when you're at from those coming from those different positioning to our extractive industry and etc. So wow. Uh, Thanks, Jorge. Um, yo lo que quería comentar es I wanted to say that I come from a region that has a more oil uh, potential. It's one of the more promising southern regions. This reserve is located on a Mapuche territory. There is fracking technology. Uh, these are biz, uh, biz companies that are really denounced internationally, and Chevron is one of the most shameful companies. They signed with uh, an Argentine company. They signed an agreement between Chevron and this company, Apartheid. They signed this three years ago. We know nothing about it. It's a total secret agreement that's uh, hovering uh, the, uh, under the pretext that it's a private company. They seem to be, have the right to confidentiality. But this is a contract that is totally servile that was uh, signed by the uh, Argentine government, which allows this company to have access to huge uh, petrol uh, oil reserves. We're talking about very deep uh, underground uh, ex uh, uh, operations using fracking. So we went to court in the past. opted for energy autonomy, which is necessary. But fracking is one of the worst industries. It uses a large quantity of uh, a lot of chemicals for uh, hydraulic uh, fracking. And the damage caused by hydraulic uh, fracking with all these chemicals generates uh, an enormous amount of damage to the environment, to health, and the inhabitants of this region. And this is irreparable damage because the, da the damage to the organism, uh, the, there is no remedy. There are heavy metals that make people sick as well. For years they've been applying these measures, but already they've had horrible situations, horrible uh, cancerous tumors, health problems, environmental and health issues. And this is data that comes from uh, public health officials. And uh, these are issued without, uh, but this contract is secret. Why is there no uh, disclosure to, um, f to show the ravages of this industry? We talk about the ravages of uh, oil industry of oil and gas. We never talk about the uh, impact of heavy metals on, 
on people's physical states. We denounced these causes before the courts. We came there with hard evidence to show that the situation was alarming and that this, this, this illness was uh, more prevalent uh, relating to this, these chemicals. And despite all of this, we weren't able to receive equal treatment before the court because labs that have to determine the degree of dangerousness uh, to exposure to uh, chemical uh, well, these are uh, sponsored uh, or uh, paid off or corrupted by the oil companies. So there's no way that we can defend ourselves before the, car uh, the courts and succeed. We can perhaps appeal to certain international courts that might give us some guarantees. But these are the current results. There's a lot of research work being done. There's a lot of denounce, uh, denouncements as well as a lot of cases and legal precedent on uh, terror land uh, safety as well regarding the violence that is uh, also carried out to have access to this territory. Now, there's a work done on the impact of heavy metals on people's uh, health, on, on the human organism and on the environment. So we end up on a lake, which is now a total uh, Molotov cocktail. We have to uh, dig nine uh, meters underneath. It's not a water table uh, when you say 10 meters deep. It's now a chemical table. We, we, uh, there are people who film this, and we show this to the people. We don't have a water table anymore. We have a chemical table now that you can light with a lighter. And we, there's an underground fire that we filmed as well. But we were able, that the, these companies were able to continue developing. Uh, the, with fracking, the use of heavy metals has uh, continued to be a serious problem, and this is an indispensable for this kind of uh, mining operation. Uh, fracking has been prohibited in many northern states. However, we still use these measures uh, with impunity. Uh, the, in our country, not just Chevron, but many other multinationals uh, do this, and even on your territory. Most of the people who opt for fracking are North American companies. I'll talk about the damages created by this technology and the protection of um, heavy metals as well, hydraulic uh, uh, fracking as well, and uh, all the health uh, risk. And uh, so far, despite our work, we weren't able to receive uh, international help to, uh, to, to solve this problem. Clint. Merci. Je the fuel industry in northern Alberta. And so as such, my remarks might not apply as much in the global south, where the violence seems to be a bit less symbolic. But I did want to make a few comments, uh, particularly about the uh, write-up of this thematic access on the internet. I think it's really uh, well done, but there might be some more things that could be elaborated a bit better uh, that are implicit, but maybe could be brought out a bit more. And one is based on some work uh, that Janelle Baker and I have been doing, as you know, Colin, to show that the, the participatory and consultative processes that Indigenous people participate in also have their own impacts in a very real sense on uh, livelihood, people's time, uh, energy, linguistic impacts, um, social organization impacts in terms of who these processes are targeted at within the community. It's not necessarily the appropriate leadership uh, with authority over given lands. And finally, uh, the point that Paul Nadasdi has brought forward several years ago where these uh, participatory processes could be premised on a pretty different ontological framework or worldview that uh, may be very difficult to bridge in, in real terms. So I, again, I think that's implicit in the description, but it could be brought forth a bit more. And similarly, uh, with what I see in Alberta anyway, is the, uh, the devolution of state processes of oversight towards uh, corporate sector and, uh, uh, if you will, co-management uh, setups. And I use the term co-management in a very loose way because they're dominated by industry. To the degree that industry has taken over a lot of uh, uh, the monitoring and uh, public re social relations and uh, even approvals in some cases. And finally, just uh, what I think I would get out of this in terms of the partnership that I'm involved in is the, uh, the ability that Cicada would provide to First Nations in Alberta to have contacts, not only with other groups in Canada that are facing similar issues, but also internationally. I think that would be really important and valuable. 
and I can already see that there's been examples discussed of that, so I think that's a really important thing to keep in the forefront. So thank you very much, and uh, bon appetit. Thank you. There, there have been some important points raised that um, uh, I would like to come back to at the later in the afternoon. We, we have a, a, a slot, time slot uh, tagged as a, a, a daily wrap-up, and I think we should talk about issues of uh, collaborative methodologies, uh, protocols, ethics, uh, uh, and probably I should provide a little bit of context for some of the directions we've already gone. Uh, you know, I think the, it is implicit in the ideology, I think, of this of Cicada that it be community driven. But we've also noted some complexities about the issue of community. What exactly is the community? And, and we have to be quite frank, we've made some choices about what, what the community is going to be uh, or what it can be within the parameters of something that we can do together. And, and we, so we need to bring that out clearly. Let's go eat.